Hey everybody, and welcome to Discussing a Murderer Extras. Uh, this episode, this session, talking with Je with Big Jeff about the Deb Strauss and Amy Lehman um, depositions. Going to kind of go through that on a on a PowerPoint presentation. So, how are you doing today, Jeff? Hey, Jeff, I'm doing great, and thanks for having me on. Uh, I really do believe that. Uh, the root of this case is the 1985 case and the subsequent civil action by, by Stephen Avery. Um, it, unless you understand that, it's very difficult to understand, um, you know, what really happened uh, in, the, in the murder case of, of Teresa Hallback with regard to the various conspiracies, uh, you know, that, that happened um, and the, the complete lack of investigation and uh, intellectual curiosity, because in every event in this case, the outcome was predetermined before it started. Uh, and in 1985, Steve, Stephen was uh, guilty, you know, on, you know, lit literally on day one with Jean Couchet tracing that picture. Uh, and for this, uh, for, for the Peg Lautenschlager whitewash of this case, it was also predetermined that there was no wrongdoing, uh, and so they 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 yeah, when they sent out their investigators, and that's what we're we're here to talk about today uh, is the um, the lack of intellectual curiosity and deep investigation that was performed in order to generate that report. So good to, you know, it's good to be I'm here. To it. Awesome, yeah, um, it's great to have you. I'm glad that we can uh, do these little extra videos and put and add more context. Uh, and I, I keep hearing you say that lack of intellectual curiosity and it's, and, and, and what that means is, well, you have some specific examples of that in the PowerPoint today. I do. That we're gonna go I do. Through. I'm sure. You will. Well, then maybe we'll just hold off on that discussion until we get to one. But yep. my overall, my overarching question today will be, is that, lack of intellectual curiosity by design or huh. is that what you're saying is were they not looking on not looking on purpose if that makes sense well i i i obviously think that that's the case um it, you know it, it it might have been uh you know had so that's let, let, let me go, go back right so so um, the way that this report was created, um, as we'll get into, was, uh, you know, Mark Rohr, the district attorney of Manitowoc County, asked for this report, uh, asked for this report. Uh, I'm not sure whether or not the, uh, the camera can, can zoom in on, you know, what, what, what this says. This is actually a copy uh, of the front page of, of the final report itself. Uh, and as you can see, the report is to Mark Rohr the district attorney in Manitowoc County from Peg Lautenschlag, right? So that, that's, that's uh, who it was from and who it was to right here on the, right here on the, right here on the front page. And the, the title of it is uh, correspondence. Well, um, is there, is, is there even a good title on right it? Yeah. Of justice. Yeah. I could read yeah. it really good. I, we got a really good shot of that. Oh, good, good. So, so, um, so that was the, the initial investigation was, was done by, um, uh, Amy Lehman and Deb Strauss, and we're here to talk about Deb today. And, uh, you know, they collected evidence, and then that evidence went, uh, you know, it, it was not in the form of a report. It was just sort of in the form, uh, you know, of, uh, of, of, of input. So they, they, the typical form letter that they kind of use, a form something or other that they use in the DOJ, that, that's either here or there. Um, but then uh, a lady by the name of Jennifer Nashold is the one who began to formulate that into a, a report. Uh, and there's reason to believe that this, gen this that Jennifer Nashold was actually, you know, sort of ag angling to throw some of the, um, you know, some of the higher ups in this case, particularly um, uh, Dennis Vogel, uh, there was going to be a specific chapter on him. But 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 the next editor up the list was Tom Fallon, uh, the same Tom Fallon who sat as special prosecutor next to Ken Kratz uh, in the in the Avery trial. 
And, you know, uh, there's a lot to believe. Uh, and if, if you if you look at the Jennifer Nashel deposition, which I do not have a PowerPoint presentation for, maybe I'll make one, um, you know, uh, that she was told by, uh, you know, essentially some of the stuff that she had put in there about Dennis Vogel, uh, massive swaths of it were deleted by, uh, by, by Tom Fallon. So, so the answer to your question is, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know whether or not um, Amy Lehman and Deb Strauss went, you know, went out there, you know, with, with, with deliberate blinders on. What, what I can tell you is, fr is from some of the things that, you know, some fr from, from the follow-up questions they didn't ask, uh, from the way they went about the investigation, it just doesn't seem to me that they dug very hard. Uh, despite the fact that they came up with the conclusion that it didn't that that it, that it didn't appear that an investigation was even done uh, again, you know against uh, in, uh, in the in the Petty Bernstein case, so um, you know what was it a, was it a whitewash from the beginning? At some point up the chain, you know they had kind of made they, they had kind of made the decision that we're going to whitewash this. Uh, it's clear uh, from the depositions that Fallon had some hand in that, uh, and the people they sent out, you know. Um, they weren't exactly, uh, you know, bloodhounds with regard to chasing the evidence. Let's put it that way. So, uh, right. I, I and, think. I mean, to be fair, aren't they? You know, I'm, I'm not to beat the drum too much on the culture of the Justice Department and the thin blue line, but there's always that just inherent. Let's not be too hard on other law enforcement kind of culture that exists. Yeah. At least that's my take. Like you already, like that's already exists by default. You know what I'm saying? Like almost yep. everybody's going to have, give them a break. You know, they're doing a hard job. We should, you know, you know don't be too tough on um, mistakes that are made. You know, it's a very hard job, but like that's the default. Now add in all of these other elements. And I think that's the scenario, uh, the looking glass that we should see this through and in and, and that's my perspective i i don't i don't see how anybody could see it any different uh you know even <laughs> well, even <laughs> <laughs> all right well let's get to it yeah sure sure so, so um what you're seeing on the front cover uh of the uh presentation is the is the picture obviously deb strauss is getting sworn in uh for her uh for her deposition uh you know she you can she she's actually wearing the same clothes as as she saw she's uh saw in the uh the man i forget whether it was episode one or two uh that we see her sitting down and giving some of her answering some of the questions in i don't think she has that black jacket on but she has uh, just wearing that white uh that white clothes on underneath is, is what is what we see her in um and uh obviously this was recorded on um May what May twelfth, uh, two thousand five. So uh, this is uh, when, you, when when you think about the mur the murder being October thirty first, two thousand five. The the, the murder is not that far away. <laughs> and when when you get it right is, down to it, just a, a you know crazy timetable background that is just slow. It was slowly creeping towards D Day. I think October thirty first is D Day in this uh, in this case. This is the basic timeline, uh, you know, not looking forward like we just did, but looking backwards. Uh, Stephen Avery was released on 9-11, 2003. Uh, Peg, Peg's document was published on 12-17. So he's, he gets out. I mean, that, and that's, that's not that long, right? That's uh, um, like three months, right? October, November, it's December. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing turnaround. A, yeah. Report that you would think... I mean, uh, we just went through um, in one of the previous episodes about how long it took for Sherry Colhane to process one uh, one scientific. I forget what it, what it was. A DNA. It was a, it was a DNA. It was a, yeah. a pubic hair. Pubic hair DNA. It took a year or something, right, for her to like. She had tested it, but it didn't. It took a whole year to disclose it. Look at how fast this report is published. Yeah. As a matter of fact, if you dig in, uh, Jeff, as my, I'll, I'll try and uh, we, maybe we can find it at the end. Um, but but that but that question comes up in, in the in the uh, in the deposition, uh, and and she and she's asked, uh, you know, did, were were you asked to terminate the investigation? Uh, and she says no. Uh, we just kind of ran out of people to interview. That's that's basically what she says. 
So they they, end, they ended it because they sort of ran out of leads to investigate. And you know, just just wait to see some of the things that were that that were that were left open. It was they so, were in a hurry to get it so, done. Yeah, yeah. And, and so exactly, exactly. So um, yeah, three months, three months to turn the document around, and that's and I I write, you know, and, and what what in my in my job uh, we often have to write uh, you know documentation that has to go through layers of management. It takes a long time. It's not simple, uh, in, especially when there's multiple tiers of reviewers. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, you know, a full third of that time was all about, you know, the document review, right. From, from the, and, and, and tuning it and going back and forth, it, you know, between the various layers of uh, taking things out in, in and out. So that to me, I would say, uh, that's why it's important to mention this. Like the timetable itself is fishy. It's questionable. It is. It is yeah. Yeah, it just it's it speaks of the sweeping under the rug, right? That it, it wouldn't take too much time because they didn't look into very much. Um, and and then the next the next line item, right, is Stephen Avery files the lawsuit, and there's actually a, you know it, it takes ten months. Now uh, the the date that's not on here that that I don't think that we know is at what date does Stephen go to see his civil rights attorneys, his civil law attorneys, uh, Stephen Glynn. Um, right. Uh, you know, and, and obviously a lawsuit like this takes time to prepare. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if they took months. Right. So that so being almost a year in between the time that the document was released uh, and, um, you know, the time that he that, that, that they actually walked it into the court and filed it and got it stamped by the by the circuit court. That, that doesn't mean he went to the lawyers that day. That means that's the day that document is submitted to the court. Uh, the, the clerk of courts and stamped, right? That's that's what that means. So that's, right. that, that's how long that took to put together. Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, they, they start, um, you know, going through their, you know, whatever lawyers do. Uh, and uh, Deb Strauss is not actually deposed again, right? 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, almost seven months, right? And she's one of the, um, she's one of the primary players in that. So, uh, you know, she, she People ask time to prepare for their depositions. There's lawyers and everything else. So it's just amazing. I mean, just it stands, it makes it even stand out more like a sore thumb as to how long it took to turn around that report. By, but just how long. That's right. All this other, yeah. From when they filed it, it took six months just to get her, her butt in the chair. And right. even longer for the people, you know, people were scheduled to be finished in October. So that would be almost a year out from yep. when the primaries were supposed to be um, deposed that never actually were deposed. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So let's move on to the next slide. All right. So um, you'll recognize that at least the, uh, you know, some, some, some cut and paste jobs from the, uh, from the document that I showed you earlier. Right. Um, so, uh, and, and for, for you know, maybe people who don't know that picture on the right, that's Peg. Uh, Peg is now deceased. Um, uh, she died of she died of cancer. Unfortunately, I don't wish uh, ill on anybody. Uh, and uh, and and, that, and that's unfortunate. She she battled cancer for a while, is my understanding, and um, unfortunate that she died. But then she's actually the mother of the current uh, the current Wisconsin district, uh, district attorney. Whose name is Josh Call? That's his mother. Uh, not, not a lot of people know that either. Uh, he didn't run using his I mother's see. name for some reason. Um, so let, let's so so let, let's discuss the purpose. So what what is the stated purpose of this document? Let me just read that for you. Uh, the Wisconsin Department of Justice evaluated the facts and circumstances of the 1985 investigation and prosecution of Stephen Avery, who was convicted of attempted first degree murder first degree sexual assault and false imprisonment imprisonment on December 14th, 1985. In September 2003, 18 years after Avery commenced his prison term, DNA testing exonerated Avery and implicated another person, Gregory Allen. The department's goal was to assess what, if any, errors occurred during the investigation and prosecution of Avery's case and whether any criminal or ethical violations were committed by anyone involved in handling the case right so that that was the goal uh 
And the findings, of course, if you skip to the end of that report um, that, that I had, that's a, if you want to read the whole report, it's you can find it on the Fall Play site. Maybe you can link to it. Um, fallplay.site, Avery, 1985. Um, her findings, and, and really, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to say whether we should blame her or not and how much of an active role she actually, excuse me, that she actually played. I, I probably, I don't honestly think it was probably all that much. You know, she's at such a high level, you know, she, you know, this, they, somebody, and she's a politician, they put some paper on her she desk. She signed and stamped and, it. Uh, uh, you know, she, she had to approve one way or another how it was going. I, I you know, it's, right. it's hard to say how much she was really involved. Uh, and, and it's it, possible she just it, signed and stamped it, right? Like, okay. It, it, it is. Yeah. Um, but even tacit approval of it, you know, she, you know, I, it, it can't, it can't be her proudest day. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's just not. Well, know, I mean, it, we it, can look at it through that context. Yeah. Like what if you didn't know anything about this? You have no horse in the race, just read the report and see if it makes sense. So that's kind of what we're, what we're doing in this, in this presentation anyway. So at the end of it, we can say, Peg, did you read it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was there enough in it? I, I mean, the, it, it was very, very slanted. Uh, the, the, the report was very slanted. The, the, the uh, well, let, let's just read what, what I felt the, the finding the, the important aspect of the findings with regard to this presentation. Uh, as it says underneath there, there's no there's no basis to bring criminal charges or assess ethics violations against anyone involved in the investigation and prosecution of this case. At worst, the sheriff's department failed to investigate a viable suspect, Gregory Allen, in its quest to capture PB's assailant quickly. Uh, had the sheriff's department taken more time in exploring potential suspects prior to blah, 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 you can imagine what it says, what, what it says after that. Right. Um, so, so uh, you know, if, if she read a very slanted report, then you, you, can, you can see her making that conclusion. Now, we've gone over, you know, for example, Jean Couchet's tracing of the, uh, you know, of, of the of the photo. You think that's an ethical violation? <laughs> you think that was mentioned right. in the report? It was it was not mentioned in the report. As a matter of fact, in, in the report. It says it was reviewed the, the uh, you know the processes through which the uh, um, the, the the lineup occurred, including the photos and sketch. Were all it was it was fa fairer than usual. So if Peg reads that, you know she's she I guess she could say um, yeah okay uh, they did they did what they could and this was just a, a big happenstance accident. So um, you know the, the the report definitely you could argue sway, uh, swayed her to just just you know, to, to sort of back that conclusion. Uh, I don't know how much of it she was really in on of the, of the, of the whitewash, but the, the document of itself uh, is, is, a, is a very big whitewash compared to right. um, what really happened. So, you know, what, what, one, of the, one of the people, things that the people found strange, and this comes up early in the deposition, what her record was. Um, uh, and as you, as you know, there's a lot of rabbit holes in this case, right? Uh, rabbit holes are places where people go down and get lost for long periods of time. And the thing about rabbit holes is that you don't always find rabbits there, um, but, but you, can stay in, you can stay lost in them for a long time. Um, <laughs> and and, and what, you know, when I first started looking at the case, one of, one of the sort of the open questions was, it, it, you know, it seems like there's an awful lot of narcs floating around the, the Avery Salvage Yard, right? Remerker. Was a narc. Uh, you know, a few other narcs. Why were there so many narcs? And it turns out, very interestingly, that Deb Strauss was a narc at one point too. That's uh, probably just because you know when, when people are doing their tour through the, uh, you know, through the Department of Criminal Investigation, it's very often for somebody who is career oriented to to sort of make a stop in every different department so they can move up the chain if they, if they want to. So you know, she spent a short time as a narc, and I just thought that that was an interesting observation. Um, that that she had that that she briefly worked in in, in narcotics, as it says in the, on the bottom of that slide. Um, when you say uh, narc, you're saying working in narcotics. Correct, correct, exactly. Yeah. She was a, she was a narcotic enforcement. Yep. Um, and uh, very interesting. So, so she she had been uh, uh, in the the department that she worked in was the Department of Public Integrity, right? Which this this uh, is the perfect you know, uh, job for the Department of Public Integrity, right? Um, right. 
uh, you know, and how long was she there? Well, since it was created in 2003. Well, it's only 2005, so she, she'd only been, she'd only been there a couple of years, <laughs> um, and she she spent most of her time on on white collar crime. And I suppose that's a good jump, right, from uh, from white collar crime to public integrity, because that's the you know, kind of crimes that you might expect politicians to commit are along the lines of what you think of as white collar crime. Um, but it's interesting to me because you know if you if you open up the Castle report, uh, you know the Calumet County report, you know the thousand page report that um, that documents uh, you know such as it does. Not some people say not very well, some people say falsely, uh, the actions of what went on. Uh, Deb Strauss is right in the middle of a lot of these interviews uh, and whatnot. Um, so uh, she 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 was there, uh, and uh, you know it's very interesting that somebody from the Department of uh, Public Integrity is right in the middle of this uh, this Avery investigation. Uh, m maybe we should hang on and try and figure out maybe why that is. Maybe we'll answer that question at the end of the video. If memory serves, no, that's to go too far off. Remaker, I think Remaker was actually given an accommodation for his work in narcotics. Is that, does that sound? I, that does ring a bell to me. It does. I bet you can find it if you Google it, probably. Dave Remaker. All right. Um, okay. Um, so the I, so again, you know, when when we first uh, when the depositions first came out, there was a concern about you know re reading them uh, end to end. The way the deposition progresses, and, and that's why I don't do that in this presentation. Just have some snippets. Um, you know, they ask for a lot of questions, uh, and uh, you know, there's a lot of I don't know, I don't recall this and that. You know, the, 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 a lot of the front matter is sort of this and that, and I don't I don't remember. Um, but she, the, the the way that the interview, the the way that the uh, deposition progresses, is they they kind of get to her. You know, how did you pick the people that you interviewed? Were you told who to interview? Um, did you pick the order yourselves, or were you directed the order? Uh, and that's questions you might expect, um, you know, Stevens attorneys to ask, because uh, you know they're, they're trying to they're they're wondering if. You know, if a script was put together, right? That, that, so that, that's essentially what that what they were asking her, and she basically said no. Um, it, it, we we didn't do that. We picked we picked who we wanted. Uh, when I say we, I talk about her and Amy Lehman. They both didn't go on all of the interviews. Uh, Deb interviewed some people. Amy interviewed other people. Some people they both went to uh, if it was if it was convenient, and uh, you know they. Sort of follow what they followed, what they thought was, um, you know, th their uh, investigative process. So there was nothing really uncovered by the, um, you know, by, by the uh, the people bringing the suit, Stephen, uh, Stephen's attorneys, with regard to finding anything regarding any scripted order uh, that, you know, that that might that might have happened. So that that's kind of the beginning of the interview, and certainly Stephen's attorneys. Uh, picked picked their order for a particular reason, right? They they were going right. up the chain because they wanted for them. They definitely wanted to be able to use, um, you know, what anybody said during that interview to to pose very specific questions to Kasurik and Vogel. You know, and you, you know how those depositions would have went had they occurred. I, I don't remember. I don't. You know, I can't remember that. That was 18 years ago. Here's a very interesting point that will that will be important at the end. Um, and uh, I'll just I'll just read so that the questions were the questions that were posed and the answers were the answers that were given. Uh, so so uh, I, I don't recall whether it's <laughs> there I go. I don't recall whether it's Ed Loy or um, Stephen Glenn. Uh, no, was it was it Stephen Glenn and John Kelly, I think, were his uh, his two lawyers. Um, uh, I don't remember which one of the ones is asking the questions here. Um, I can do the, the answer question. if you want. Yeah. OK. The question. Yeah back to a point in time immediately preceding when the publicity occurred, indicating that Stephen Avery had been exonerated and released. Okay. And ask at any knowledge of the Avery case. Prior to him being released? No. Right. I did not. You knew nothing of it. Right. <laughs> So, so that sounds to me like um, if she hadn't heard of that case, then she must have not known a lot about Stephen Avery Pierce, right? I mean, is, isn't it fair to be able to draw that conclusion uh, from from that interaction? What what did she know about Stephen Avery? 
Nothing. According to her, nothing. That's right. So, um, so everything she learned, as the title of the slide indicates, she learned. She learned during this three-month investigation. So question, all right, did you attend any general meeting involving the whole team before you had began the investigation? Yes, I did. And do you remember when that was? No, I don't. Who was present? It would have been myself and Amy, and I believe Jennifer Nashhold and Monica Burkert Brist. And I don't know if Tom Fallon was in that meeting or not. And it would have been Mark Rohr from Manitowoc, the district attorney. And then he had an assistant DA with him, and I don't recall. Michael Griesbach? <laughs> yeah, so that would, it would have been Michael Griesbach would be, would be, would be the, uh, the one. So, so he, they, they were definitely at the kickoff meeting. So the kickoff meeting is sort of defining, you know, why are you doing this, right? Um, and... Uh, uh, and so, so if we go on to the next one, we learn a little bit more. Um, I mean, is about, that about, is that common about, practice to have that kind of kickoff meeting and be like, hey, we're going to investigate you? Well, well, that's the thing is they weren't actually investigating. So remember, Mark Rohr is the one who <laughs> requested the investigation, right? That he, so, I got you. Yeah. So, so I, I think, yes, it very much is uh, common practice. If you're going to set two people off to do some type of a, a study or an investigation, to sort of fully explain to them, you know, what, what, what's, what's the intended, uh, you know, hypothesis of this investigation? Were, were, were there any criminal or ethical violations for which people need to be cited, right? And that, that's, what, what, that's what you're sending, sending you off into the, you know, in, into the wild blue to he investigate here. So I do believe um, that, that there, would, there would be that type of meeting and they'd spell out the reasons why. Um, Very good. So, yeah, uh, and I, I think that that's in the uh, on the next slide, they get a little bit deeper in, into into why that is. Um, so the question. Uh, all right. At the meeting, did Mark Rohr report that he had been receiving information in the courthouse since the time that Avery's conviction had been vacated, uh, that there were people who had been in the DA's office or sheriff's office at the time who thought that Stephen Avery had not committed the crime and that Gregory Allen had. Uh, and they, 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 Mark Rohr and his assistant were very concerned about that. Yes, the answer is yes. And she follows I on believe, with another answer. I believe that was the driving force behind him coming and requesting that investigation is that he had started to hear these types of comments from people in his office. Okay. Now, uh, in, 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 in the name of intellectual curiosity, let's move on to the next slide. I, example of intellectual curiosity number one. Again, I repeat, the purpose of the uh, investigation, the purpose of, uh, stated purpose of the investigation, I'm only going to read the last sentence. The department's goal was to assess what, if any, errors occurred during the investigation and prosecution of Avery's case, and whether any criminal or ethical violations were committed by anyone involved in the handling of the case. Question, did you ever interview <laughs> extensively Mr. Rohr or Mr. Griesbach about what they had been told and by whom that gave them this concern? No. <laughs> Do we have to go back to the previous slide? <laughs> doesn't she just... <laughs> Well, well, so uh, so was she, she was at the she, yeah she was at the kickoff meeting. In, people in the office from people in his office, and so then. So so did you ever bother to interview him? So, so we had the kickoff meeting. meeting, right? Did you ever bother to talk to him about who these people were, and what right. and what they were saying, and where they might where they might have got that information? No. <laughs> that, my friend is a lack of intellectual curiosity. <laughs> Who told you exactly. that? But, no. but why is it? Why didn't she do it? Because she didn't care? She didn't want to? She didn't think it was relevant? 
I don't know why she didn't. She didn't. They, they, you know, I, I don't. I don't think uh, they asked her uh, why she didn't do it. It was just that she didn't do it. <laughs> was was yeah, where they left in it. This in this case, case, the case you, he doesn't need to prove why she didn't do it. She it, she's not on trial. She just they just need to spell out very clearly that she didn't. She didn't do the part she was supposed to do. Right. She she but we she, can she speculate did on motive. But we can speculate on motive. You know and. That one's well. I think when we get to the end of today, the motive will be a little more clear when we <laughs> play that uh, audio clip, right? That's right. That's right. We have a surprise coming for everybody who, who who may not be familiar with the case. Everybody who's familiar with the case knows the exact audio clip we're going to play. But maybe there's some people who they, maybe there's some people who don't. Now, um, so so uh, um, imagine if she had interviewed Mike Griesbach. Uh, and uh, th this this slide we actually put up and read from uh, in our uh, last minute, and may maybe in, in this for the sake of time now, you can just sort of reinsert, you know, the what what it, what it says on on this slide. Um, sure. But but this but what Michael Griesbach says is damning to Dennis to Dennis Vogel. Uh, that there is. Um, there's just there's just no there's just no two ways about it. As a matter, right. so so in in this in this uh, uh, reading, which which you can you can uh, view the clip that uh, Jeff is going to link to, uh, what you'll find uh, is that uh, Griesbach is talks about a phone call that he had uh, with with, with Kisurik, um and uh, uh, Vogel specifically asked Griesbach. Excuse, uh, I, I messed that all up. He talks about a uh, Griesbach talks about a phone call. That he had, that he got from Vogel, where Vogel asked him a very specific question about whether or not there was a, a file about Gregory Allen in the 1980, uh, uh, 1985 Stephen Avery file. And we talked about that file. It was the file that said that Gregory Allen had attacked a victim, a different victim, uh, for, in that exact location on the, on the same beach. And that file indeed was in the Stephen Avery file. Uh, and Griesbach is talking, you know, is reflecting upon his own, um, you know, what 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 went through his mind, uh, you know, when he got that phone call from from Vogel, uh, and he says, uh, you know, <laughs> he he the only th conclusion that he can come to in his mind is that he do he knew that Vogel knew that that Avery, that Avery was innocent. How else could he take it, right? Uh, and he goes on. He goes on to say um, that uh, um, Dennis Vogel is, is is an exception to attorneys who have you know high ethical standards. He, he he's really throwing uh, Vogel under the bus here, right? This is a a guy who holds office, uh, who held I think was holding office at the time he wrote that book, and saying that about somebody who held office pre previously. That's that's pretty that's pretty damning. Um, and, you know, something that I found that, that I, I didn't even realize, uh, you know, in, in, until he said it, the, um, the sort of the lineup process that they went through uh, and, and getting Penny Bernstein to, you know, say, yeah, it was Stephen Avery that I saw, that pretty much obviated any opportunity to go after Gregory Allen for this crime. Because the eyewitness, the primary eyewitness, already said it was it wasn't uh, Gregory Allen; it was Stephen Avery, right? So, so, so that whole process, that clown show that they dragged Stephen through uh, with the traced, uh, you know, the, the traced uh, artist sketch uh, and the you know the the ridiculously suggestive suggestive eyewitness process eliminated Gregory Allen as uh, you know his uh, the law enforcement's ability to prosecute him for that for that crime. On to the next. So, so in in the um, you know as as you know, um, uh, th this this gets on to the 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 um, the phone call, the Brown County phone call that Coburn handled, uh, and we know what happened there was that um, you know uh, uh, Coburn didn't end up writing the report uh, on that phone that what night I forget the I, I forget the exact date. Um, that he got was uh, he spent ten more years in prison, so I guess that would have been like what 1983 or something like that. Phone call from Brown County where where Gregory Allen says, "Yeah, there's somebody in Manitowoc in prison for an attack that I committed." Uh, so the Brown County calls, Coburn picks up, 
doesn't write a report, but when Avery is exonerated, he writes the report. And where does the report end up? In Peterson's safe, right? Um, and so there are some other items in Peterson's safe. As a matter of fact, there's two cassette uh, two cassettes that were also discovered in in, uh, in, in the in the safe, uh, and uh, they asked Deb Strauss. So so uh, Deb Strauss was given possession of these two cassettes, and this is uh, h- how the questioning goes about those two cassettes. Uh, the first cassette. Um, uh, so so the uh, she, so what they're talking about here when they say the first one, which is a narrative, they're handing her a report about the cassette. The first one is a narrative, is just a summary of an event on April 5th. Uh, I've, and this is, um, oh, this, sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reading the answer. So she's, ha- she's handed a paper, uh, and this paper is really just explaining, for all practical purposes, that she gave the, that she gave the tape back. Gave the tape back. Um, and, uh, you know, she's just, she's just telling about it. The first one is the narrative is a summary of an event on April 5th. I returned a cassette tape to William Beck, Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department. This cassette tape came out of Peterson's safe. Uh, and what's the second page? The second page is a copy of our evidence receipt as to when we received it and then the process uh, that the tape, whose possession it was in until it was returned. Okay. I'm going to ask the question now. What was it? What, uh, uh, what was it a cassette of? You want to read the answer? Sure. We were never able to play it. It was a very old cassette tape, and we did not have the capability of producing or reproducing that tape to be able to listen to it. Now, you're an audio guy, or right? you have a podcast. Is is that is that believable to you? Mostly no. <laughs> Because why would it be in a safe if it was? See, here's the thing. If you want to destroy a tape, you take a magnet and you can just destroy it. Or you can burn it. You can throw it out. Why would you keep a tape that didn't work? I don't know. Right? Why would you, why would you lock up a tape? That didn't work. That had no well, capability let, capability of producing or reproducing sound, right? Yeah, and l- let's let's take a step back because the question you asked is brilliant. Why, why would you lock it up? Because you didn't want anybody else exactly. to be able to get it, right? <laughs> or hear what was on right. it. <laughs> you don't want yet. You don't want it destroyed. Yeah. Right. Because it's evidence, right? Somebody, somebody really finds it and asks for it, they can get it. But boy, I, it's it's if I put something in my safe, I'll tell you what, it's there for a reason. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, you don't and, put and, irrelevant stuff. But might might it have been? Might it have yeah. been the you know? Because you know that all the, the reason why we, you know there's a whole slew of dispatch calls that recently got released. The reason we have these is because phone phone calls in and out of police stations are recorded, right? Right. Is it possible that that was a recording of, um, you know, the Brown County phone call? I, don't I know. mean, that is some pretty interesting speculation to say. I mean, it when you put have a few buckets, right? You have a bucket of speculation. That's a pretty strong bucket you got there. <laughs> Yeah, we don't we don't know what those tapes are, but they were in Peterson's safe, and so he didn't. I mean, it could it could I mean, have been something related. related to this 1985 case. What what I mean, we technically there was a phone call, and if you and if you follow the logic that you're laying out there, phone calls are recorded, but we could never find this recording of the supposed phone call from Brown County that we can doesn't exist, and then we find a tape. In a that safe. we can't play, right? Two that tapes. We can't play. <laughs> Two tapes. Was the uh, summary of an event on April fifth? Yeah, that that's her. That's her returning. That that's her report of her returning the tape. Oh, okay. I see. Okay, I got yeah. you. All right, and then so, let's talk two? about tape number two. If you take a look at the second page of the exhibit. Okay. It was given to you by Sheriff Peterson. Correct. Was it part of the materials that he retrieved from the safe 
uh, at another place in his office and gave to you uh, the day that you visited with him? I believe it came from his safe. Okay. What did it purport to be? Was it described to be something to you? I don't remember. I just remember it was a cassette tape that he had regarding the Stephen Avery investigation. Okay. And uh, you never did solve the puzzle of what it said, and there was no technology that you sought out uh, that would have told you what, what was on it? Uh, and of course, you don't. You don't even need the um, the answer to that. You don't uh, need that. the answer. <laughs> the answer. The answer is no. <laughs> Nothing to hear here. <laughs> I mean, so, so look, we're just using we're just using logic here. We're just putting together these pieces of evidence in a chronology. That's it. We're not. There's not. We're not changing anything. We're just saying, here's a cassette that she says was related to the Stephen Avery investigation. Peter, she got it out of Peter's safe. Cassette? What could be on a cassette? Like, wh what are the other alternatives? Someone recording Stephen Avery when he wasn't listening? Someone t talking about... Uh, it, it, there's, there's only, like I said, the buckets of speculation, right? Yep, yep. The one bucket that you have is... This is a recording of the Brown County Sheriff's Department calling Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department and saying, hey, you know that guy, Stephen Avery, that got locked up for that rape? Well, we just had a guy who very compellingly told me that the wrong guy is locked up for it. And I think you guys better take a second look. Yeah, I don't know. It was that it could it could have been that, you know, for all, you know, in the, in the world of probability, it probably wasn't that. But, you know, for some reason, Peterson gave it to her out of his safe uh, and they never found out what it was. Well, this is were not able to, to the I, listeners. I want to know what you think could possibly in all the realm of speculation. Give me the, you know. Anyway, put it in the comments. What could it be? Yeah, put it in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> but you see what I mean by that? So you asked me at the beginning, of uh, what, what do I mean by intellectual curiosity? If somebody handed me that tape, uh, you know, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be on the, I, you know, you, you, between you and me, I bet we know 100 people who we call to say, you know, do you have the technical means to be able to play this tape? And, right. and you have the full, you have the, and, and not, not only that, you and I are just people, right? Uh, you, know, right. you, uh, you, you know, we're talking about like the people who have the, the backing of the FBI to get this solved. So what we're it's saying like is the equivalent of having a blank check on the Internet today. Well, you got to exactly. get this audio file fixed. It doesn't matter how much it costs. We can pay anything. Just find someone that can do it and we'll pay for it. Like, that's all you have yeah. to do. You go yeah, right to your department. That. They probably have a guy. Of course, they have a guy at the Department of Criminal Investigation who can play anything or he, yeah. or, or somebody in Quantico, right? Play it. Or they give you a logical reason why they can't play it. Not, Oh, I couldn't, you know, I put it in the machine in the machine. I tell you, <laughs> I just, it just wouldn't play. Right. Did that you try the volume one. button? <laughs> <laughs> if she'd only thought of that, it might be, we might, that we might not be sitting here today. <laughs> So, so the deposition goes on, uh, you know, and that was really, you know, so, so you kind of, you kind of see now, hopefully it's becoming clearer when I, when I say a lack of intellectual curiosity, what I'm talking about. Um, right. So, so let, let's maybe we can move on to sort of the next area of the, the deposition. Um, first of all, did you check out the story? If you recall that Arland Avery would not sign the affidavit because it was made clear to, to Arlen, to Avery, by someone within the sheriff's department that if he signed such an avid affidavit, his job would be in jeopardy. So let's, let's talk about what, af, what, what affidavit we're talking about, right? So um, we, we actually saw Arlen, to Avery, um, on, the, uh, on, on MAM-1. He's not dressed in his police uniform because I think by then he was retired from the police. 
and, and Ireland says, you know, says something that I, uh, in that, in the first episode that I very vehemently disagreed with that it was sort of a, you know, sort of a case of, um, you know, mistaken identity or police myopia. You know, it was, and it was not in my opinion. It was a, you know, it was a setup from the, from the very beginning. Um, but, but you'll recall that one of the things that um, Stephen did that day uh, was he helped pour concrete uh, at the, you know, at, at, at the yard. And there were a bunch of people there. There were like, the, uh, th there were 16 eyewitnesses of the fact that he was there helping to pour the, the concrete. Arland Avery was one of those witnesses. Uh, and uh, he was asking, and, and um, the affidavit that's being discussed in this paragraph is an affidavit that he, that he uh, would have signed um, attesting to the fact that he was an eyewitness of his own nephew at the Avery Salvage Yard on that day of the Bernstein attack. So, uh, and so, so now they're asking, uh, if they, if, if, uh, if Deb did any investigation of, uh, what Arland reported that said, if he signed an affidavit, his job would have been in jeopardy. So, um, the, she the, says, the, we spoke with Arland Avery. Uh, all right. And do you remember what he said about that affidavit matter? Not without reading the report. All right. Uh, did Arlen Avery, to your independent recollection, confirm to you that Vogel told him not to volunteer the story about the chalk, the cement chalk, uh, on the shoulder of Stephen Avery when he testified as a witness? I do not have an independent recollection of that, <laughs> which oh, is uh, I, I just a longer way of saying I don't recall. <laughs> That's like the full sentence version of it, yeah? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I do not have an independent recollection of that. It's like yeah. the robot answer. Is that like, <laughs> I do not have an independent recollection? You know, it's well, I, and and you know, let, let's again in, in a what, what did you call it? Our our pile of speculation. What do you Little think? Bucket, our, you know? our bucket. What what do you think? Arlen Avery said to Deb Strauss. What do I think Arlen Avery said? That's a really, that's a really interesting question. I think, I don't know. Is he, can he be honest with her? Does he feel, does Arlen Avery at that time, was he retired at this point? Uh, yeah, I, I believe he was. I mean, he, he would have been, you know, it's because he's, yeah, he, 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 I'm pretty sure he was retired. As a matter of fact, he had been demoted. He's not. He doesn't. No one's going to fire him if he tells the truth. I guess is my question. I, I think that I, I believe that that's the case. I believe he's resigned. so he's a little bit less pressure. You know, he could. It's 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 a it's a rough one because I want to look at it the other way. How important that statement would have been had Arland been able to sign an affidavit that he saw Stephen. How but what do you, but what do you think? Yeah. Court of yeah. law, right? Yeah, that's right. And that would have been an absolute nail in the coffin of Stephen's innocence because you have, what, now 23, 24 witnesses, and one of them is an officer of the court? Of and the his law? Uncle. And his uncle. And his uncle? Yep. I mean, that's that's the big... Well, what are you are you calling another officer a liar? Is that what you're saying? You're saying that this yeah. guy's straight up lying for his nephew and all these other people. So the the level of I don't know in a court of law when you're trying to prove someone's innocent, who's going to be a better witness than another cop? Than a cop, yeah. And so that's why it's so important. So I, I, I don't agree. know what Armand said, but just to put it in context, that's how important of a question this is it is uh that's the first question what about the second question what do you think what do you think that arland might have said to deb about that second question um to your independent recollection uh, uh did arland confirm to you that vogel told him not to volunteer the story about the chalk that he personally saw it's interesting because she says she doesn't have an independent recollection without the report but it clearly sounds like she did ask him Oh, I, I, he's and remember he's he's alive, right? So, right. Um, 
he Arland Avery, I, I'm sure, would have been uh, interviewed by by Stevens' lawyers, and mm-hmm. he would have told them <laughs> that this that Vogel right. told him this. And I, right. it, to me, there's there's no doubt in my mind, right, that uh, uh, that you know he that he told Deb Strauss, Vogel told me, Vogel told me to, um, <laughs> you know, that, that not, not, not to, to say anything about the shark. Right, not to say anything about the cement dust on Stephen's clothes. Right, it's just it, uh, <laughs> I, I just can't I can't see him not saying that uh, to 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 De- to Deb Strauss. Now, we what we don't have is we we don't have um, the um, what they call I think the five ninety twos. I think the the, the four the interview reports that um, that uh, Deb and Amy submitted that were used for the creation of the report. So we don't mm. we don't have that, and um, you know, and and certainly, any but, specific quotes did not make it rise to the level of the, the you know the pet the peg document. Right? But, so that, that's but why I, else would they ha- why would they have interviewed him otherwise? Otherwise, he has no relevance to the case. Yeah, so so the, I mean the deposition's a funny thing, right? So I, I they guess have the to rules. Ask that. Yeah. The, the rules of the deposition, though, are, are what do you independently recall? And, and this, this would be, right. you know, if, if we get, you know, ask Travis, if, if you, I don't know how much you've interviewed with Travis. He's a, a lawyer, uh, does a lot of work on this case and is, is very generous about giving away his, uh, you know, his time. He, he, I, I asked him this question once and, and the answer is something along the lines of, uh, you know, when you give this type of deposition, it's about what you independently recall. You're not supposed to refresh your memory by reading reports and things like that. So, oh, okay. um, you know, so, so it was, it was somewhere, it, it was documented somewhere, but she just, she's just given the Ronald rig, you know, she's given the, I don't, I don't remember. Alrighty. So, you know, ha- having asked those bombshell questions about Arland Avery and sort of at least entered into the record um, that they addressed Deb about the, um, you know, about, about these two questions, particularly in my mind, you know, was, was he dissuaded from signing the affidavit? Uh, and was he dissuaded about telling a story about Shaw, about cement dust, essentially, that was on Stephen Avery's clothes? That's all you can ask, right? And so you move on. And the, the, next, the next person they move on to on the following slide uh, is a woman by the name of Jill Mertens, uh, who is one of the people who worked uh, in the DA's office uh, and um, her statement was, uh, we told Vogel uh, that I think it is Gregory Allen. When she's talking about we, she's talking about her and, and some other people in the office. So the right. question, now, wh- when, she, when she tells you that she told Dennis Vogel that did you, consider, did, did you consider that to be of importance given the nature of the investigation you were conducting? I think this is one of those... We looked at it and said, okay, you know what? How do you know? You know, it was like, well, I it it looks like him. That's it. All we were doing was asking, you know, how you know it, what makes you think it, and these were the responses. Right. But she's gone a step further now. She's not talking about talking with her pal. She's talking about telling the district attorney. I think that this is Gregory Allen, right? Correct. Okay, I'm asking you, at that juncture, is that an important fact to you? What everybody says to us was considered an important fact because it was a piece of what we needed to obtain. Okay, I understand you documented it. I'm asking you, as a living human being, was that revelation important to you? It was not important. It was not not important. It certainly <laughs> corroborated what Mr. Rohr had told us. <laughs> and you know, so what? So I mean, that, that's like probably worth this. Huh? <laughs> it was not not important. The truth. It was just a point of corroboration. Right. You can't admit that it was. That it was important, but you have to say, well, it's not not important. Like, come on. <laughs> we know what you're doing. Everybody sees it. You're just embarrassing yourself. She's doing she's doing a dance. 
Um, and, uh, you know, at the time, this is before Stephen Avery's convicted. These people who work at the office are going to the district attorney and saying, I don't think it's Stephen Avery. I think it's Gregory Allen. And, uh, you know, this uh, it, it made it into the whitewash under the guise of, uh, you know, what, what we found in the findings is that they just failed to investigate another sub, uh, suspect. Had they that done question. that? Yeah, exactly. Had they done that? That question, I'm asking you at this juncture, is that an important fact to you? What everybody says is important. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but every, yeah. what everybody says is important in this investigation. Like, come on. No, <laughs> this is more important than certain things that people say. This is one of the, the most important prongs in this investigation, which was going to lead you to more, more clues, right? This is one of your keystone questions to be asking in this investigation and you put it off as if well everything's important like come on don't give us that gaslight yeah. approach so so if if you're i mean if, if you're if you're going to pursue a conviction right the district attorney dennis will remember remember what grease box said about him right that that uh you know um you, you know that that he does not ethics challenge right that's essentially what Griesbach said about Vogel um is it is it ethical to pursue conviction of somebody that you know is innocent the answer to that is obviously no right so so that, that doesn't doesn't this question get to the heart of whether or not uh, Dennis Vogel had an ethical violation when he you know just decided to ignore what Jill Martin said, had had basically said that, and her and her commentary is not coming from a uh, from a place of just you know uh, she's not pulling Gregory Allen's name out of her out of her ass, right? She's got she's getting that because she knows Manitowoc PD is following uh, Gregory Allen, and that this is way more Gregory Allen's method of operation. Uh, she she this, she's not inventing this name out of thin air, right? This is not somebody she saw on TV. Um, so, so again, this, this gets to, to my mind, they're getting to the heart of the ethical violation of Dennis Vogel in not pursuing, uh, you know, uh, or, or continuing to pursue the prosecution of Stephen Avery when there were so many legitimate questions as to whether it was actually him. So again, lack, lack of investigation. Right? Why, why, right? Why didn't you think it was important to sort of dig any further? Right. In other words, did you go ask Dennis Vogel about why he decided to ignore her, uh, you know, her, her protestations? And the answer is no, she didn't. She just she interviewed Joe Martins. OK, I got I got your statement. It, cor it corroborates what Roar said. And that's it. I'm putting it down from here. Which, you know, you know, leave the details or the personal. Let's, you know, let's give the benefit of the doubt. It just seems like by default, it's let's go through the motions and. You know, try not to be too hard on law enforcement, and it, it you know, it doesn't seem like, and that's what you, you, we keep coming back to that lack of intellectual curiosity. Is is it by design? Is the question that I asked in the beginning, and to me, it seems every statement pushes us closer and closer to that. But should we move to the next? Should we should. <laughs> So you might recall there were three pe three people there, um, and uh, what the next person's name was uh, Beverly Badker. Uh, she was a paralegal in Vogel, uh, Vogel's office. Uh, and um, uh, why, why don't you start off with there's obviously a question written uh, asked of her that I omitted. Why don't you read the answer? Vogel told Badker that Allen could not have committed this crime. Because Allen was on probation in Door County at the time the crime was committed. And what did you find out about whether or not at the time that Penny, the Penny Bernstein assault took place? Uh, Allen, well, let, let, let me let me try that again. <laughs> and what did you find out about whether or not at the time that Penny Bernstein assault took place that Gregory Allen was on probation? That he had not was not on probation at that time. 
Isn't, isn't that interesting, Jeff? <laughs> that, that's a famous statement by Vogel that he checked with Allen's probation officer and, uh, <laughs> and that he couldn't have done it because, because, he was on, because he was on probation at the time. He called the probation officer. And now we're getting confirmation from, from Deb. She looked into this and guess what? He was not on probation at that time. Isn't, it's isn't not that... something that he said, she said, this is documented. No, we went back and checked. Gregory Allen was not on probation at that time. So who did you speak to, Vogel? You didn't speak to anybody. You <laughs> that, lied. That's, that's okay, great. So, so let's continue with the question. Did you then go back and talk to Badker about how she had been informed that he was on probation? No. Okay. Did you make it? Did you make any effort, if you recall, to locate an agent, other than the one uh, to whom you spoke, who might have been uh, Gregory Allen's probation agent uh, uh, in uh, July 29th, nineteen eighty-five? I seem to recall he didn't have a probation agent. Okay. Uh, on those occasions, Vogel simply would tell uh, Badker Allen. Uh, sorry. Okay. And on those occasions. Vogel simply would tell Badker Allen couldn't have committed the crime. Correct. Okay. And that occasions, occasions. Right. <laughs> it happened more than once, right? Vogel told uh, Badker multiple times that Allen couldn't have committed the crime. Right? And, and Badker and, 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 is the paralegal. Again, exactly, exactly. The paralegal and, 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 in Vogel's office who's typing stuff up and doing the the, yep. the grunt work? Is that what you would say? Yeah, I'd say that, yep. So, so again, <laughs> the question that you just asked, wh wh where's the file? How, how did, did Vogel come, come across? Who is it that he possibly could have talked to um, that made that made this mistake? Maybe... Uh, you know, maybe he did call somebody and that somebody did say that he was uh, Gregory Allen's probation officer, right? It, it, it could be an honest mistake here by Volgo, right? Could, as, and it could, it could start raining nickels too, but uh, it could be an honest mistake by Volgo. Who, where, where is Deb Strauss's sort of, you know, investigative prowess to dig in as to why Dennis Vogel actually thought this? Is it, you know, was it an honest mistake or was this, you know, how, how would you describe how, how, how can you possibly describe this? Uh, because it's her. She's trying to figure out whether or not there is an ethical violation or something criminal here. Is, is right. it is it criminal to, you know, to, 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 to say um, that you know, Gregory Allen was on proba was on probation and I called his probation officer. So it couldn't have been him. Is, is that a criminal violation? I don't know. Is it an ethical violation? Yeah, it sure as hell, if, if you can't say how you came to that conclusion, it sure seems to me like that's an ethical violation. Well, I, I if, you, if you look at the highlighted spot right here on the word occasions, and that on those occasions, correct, multiple times, you have it right on the slide. So it's not a one-off. You know, a one-off could be, man, I really thought he was on probation. I knew he was on probation earlier. Uh, or another alternative, I checked with the probation agent. They told me he was, but it was their mistake on their end. Well, then let's go find that mistake. But the lack of intellectual curiosity yep. doesn't did, lead did she, us. Did, she, she did not look. I mean, she, she, she is not investigating a very strong potential ethical or criminal violation here, right? That Dennis Vogel proceeding. It's a, it's, it's, Certainly, we can argue that's a dereliction of duty, right? Or, uh, it's a uh, right. there's this is not an honest mistake. It certainly it rises to the level of dishonesty to to, to reach the high hell to me. So I, I don't I don't know how else to say it and how they could how they could conclude that there was no uh, ethical violation here is beyond me. Uh, that that this is one of the big revelations to me. So agreed. Yeah. So uh, Le Le Leroy, Leroy Belke uh, was a law enforcement officer uh, uh, at, at, at the time, uh, and he overheard something critical that, that he that he reported. Uh, and, uh, you know, from the from the text on the on the right, 
um, we can we can really see what's uh, what, what what's what's going what's going on with this. So he he this is him talking to uh, a man named Belts, who's the captain of detectives, as we can see. Um, so maybe we can start with that question. Uh, according to this statement, Belts was captain of detectives at the time. And uh, the answer to that was. Um, oh, correct. Correct. <laughs> uh, uh, and according to Belkey, Bet Belts then tells him, we're not going to bring this individual in for questioning. And that probably correct. talking about Greg, right? Uh, and he tells you why. Yes. Uh, and what does he tell you why? Uh, what is his explanation for why they're not doing it? Bells had told Balki the sheriff wanted Stephen Avery convicted of this crime because the description provided by the victim matched Avery's. Okay, now in the next paragraph, it would be one, two, three, four paragraphs down on page 5,530. This is, again, Belkey talking with you about his discussion with Belts. And Belkey tells you that Belts told him about the Manitowoc, Manitowoc County District Attorney. That the sheriff had already contacted the Manitowoc County District Attorney. And Bells told Belkey the sheriff told the DA not to screw this case up because the sheriff wanted Avery convicted of this crime. So, so, so here's a law enforcement officer that that overhears this, right? Who, who's um, who, who wants to take specific actions that are specifically thwarted, right, from from the higher ups, uh, partic particularly Kasurik, and he says why? Because Kasurik wants Avery, and not only that, Kasurik took the, um, you know, sort of the. Well, let's talk about what kind of step it is. But he calls up Vogel and says, um, don't screw this case up. We actually know he uses a different word than screw this case up. But the word means the same thing as screw. Uh, but it's not. It's best not used in, in polite company. So so what what kind of person, you know, so how, how, what, what is it? What does it tell you about sort of the, the, the power that Kisurik is wielding uh, in, in Manitowoc County that he can call up the D.A. and say, don't F this one up? It's quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Because usually the uh, the power would be the other way around, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yep. Because the usually power to lock somebody up. <laughs> to the sheriff, don't screw this case up because I want to get him. It, yep. It's like it's the opposite that you see on Law & Order, right? That's, 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 what, that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> and it's the opposite, yeah. too, when, when Kratz comes around, right? When Kratz, when Kratz gets on board... Uh, they refer to Kratz as the boss, right? It's it's the prosecutor that's the boss. Right. But not but, in this uh, instance. But that tells you what type what type of power Kasurik is wielding. It all goes back. I mean, it just it just goes all the way back to Sandra Morris, right? Uh, and wow. and uh, who, whose whose husband was a deputy sheriff. Stephen runs his cousin off the road, uh, and uh, that that is not going to happen. You know, under under this thin blue line in my watch, that's just right, and that, and that's what happened in, uh, in in 1985. And Stephen was completely railroaded, and he, and here you see, you know, Kasurik just literally, you know, given given the Heisman, right, <laughs> given the Heisman to the people who are trying to do any type of real investigation. No, we have the guy, we want Avery convicted for this. It matches the it matches the ridiculous. Uh, a uh, picture that um, but you didn't. Jean Couchet drew, etc. And uh, you didn't you match know. the description, right? <laughs> no, it did not. No, it didn't. It did. It didn't at all. As a matter of fact, the 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 height the height was wrong, the weight was wrong, the eye color was wrong. Um, it 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 didn't it didn't really match the the, the description of the hair was wrong. Uh, it didn't really match Stephen Avery at all. And we know it was wrong. We know <laughs> we know it was wrong. We know it was wrong. Yeah, that's right. Exactly right. So, um, you know, but again, the the, pur the purpose is to uncover any ethical violations. And if you have the, um, you know, the, the sheriff, the Manitowoc County Sheriff, 
seems to me to be reaching down and sort of putting his thumb and, and halting any type of extra independent investigation. Right. Is that well, the right thing to do? If, no, if hindsight is I, if hindsight is twenty twenty, then what kind of blue blockers is this Deb Strauss wearing? Yeah, yep. And and she she's supposed to be inve- inve- investigating Kasurik, right? Is, is she is mm-hmm. she going back? Is she asking the right questions to determine whether or not Kasurik had any ethical violations? Doesn't seem to me like she's digging hard enough here. That's that's know. that's the po- that's the point of this, right? right? What what is she what is she supposed to do? What she's like, supposed to dig like up? I said you're going through the motions and you're taking what people say at face value, but you're not digging. So you're really just you're going there, you're interviewing people, you're filing a report with no yeah. barometer of you know one way or the other, or you, you don't care, you're indifferent, and you and you don't investigate, right? It's yeah. uh, it's quite interesting. Like, you know, withholding the truth isn't lying, kind of thing. You know, where it's like that. Well, I didn't lie. Yeah, but you yeah. didn't you didn't disclose what actually happened. So it's it's not technically it's not lying, but you're it's decep- It's a form of deception, right? There, there, there are just, sins that, of om- there are sins of commission and there are sins of omission, right? right. And then you, is, you see that in the 2005 case when they just failed to interview people that's right. that should have been interviewed, right? So it's like that's a whole act of it's not quote unquote lying, but it's, it's a sin it's of omission, a form of deception. Well, so. <laughs> So, right, so, she, so she's asked a whole, a holistically, right? She now let's move on to the next, move on to the next slide, right? Um, she admits basically to the blind that she had on. So here, here's here's the question. Okay, let me ask you this in general with respect to these interviews of the Manitowoc Police Department. As we said a second ago, Belkey was was the police department. Recall that Manitowoc, had, you know, d- deviating from the question a second, Man- Manitowoc has both a police department and the sheriff's department, and those are two different entities, um, uh, you know, be, being, a, being a county and a, uh, a city. So, um, you know, uh, starting the question over, okay, let me ask you in general, with, with these interviews of Manitowoc Police de- uh, Department personnel, did you utilize any of the documents that were provided to you by the city of Manitowoc Police Department in interviewing the various de- uh, detectives who had been surveilling Gregory Allen in July of 1985? No. <laughs> I wonder why, Jeff. Can, can you think of a reason why? <laughs> well, so it, what were you looking for? As we're looking at this, like, again, we know kind of the outcome of this and we know where we're going with this. And, and we, again, to reference this clip that we're going to share. But it's like if we were investigating her now, what we're seeing is just the the complete lack of professionalism the complete lack of you keep saying that term so well intellectual curiosity yep but why but why so what what so what do you what what does she admit that she's looking for in her answer to a question i didn't really state what we were looking for really in our contacts with the city of Manitowoc Police Department, the city of Manitowoc Police Department, was to determine if they had gone over to the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department or the district attorney's office and notified them that Mr. Allen should be considered as a suspect in this case. Really, what their background and how they were handling Mr. Allen was really not the focus of what we were doing. So moving on, moving on, the 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 case, the case, the deposition continues, right? We, that that's a picture of uh, you know at at the time we know that Kasurik had retired and the actual sheriff uh, of um, Manitowoc County was Peterson, and that's that's a picture of Peterson right there on the right. Um, the the uh, you know the, the the title tells what's going on here. Uh, question: If if you look at the first paragraph, did you make a statement to him to Peterson? about the fact that you were going to assure him that the, attorney's gen- the attorney general's office was not going to reinvestigate the crime. 
Yes. So, so wh why do you suppose that? <laughs> so it's interesting, right? So, so, P so Peterson is asking if, um, if, if the, if it's the, if the job uh, or, or what, what, what Deb is doing or what uh, is, is going, you know, uh, is what's going on. Are they going to sort of reinvestigate um, you know, the, the, the details of the, of the crime itself, right? And did, you, did she tell him that? Um, why did she tell him that? Why do you suppose he asked that? <laughs> and just to be clear for the folks at home, the crime that we're talking about is the is Penny. rape of Penny Burns. Yeah, that's right. So, yes. so, so just for, just for some clear. reason, P Peterson, is, Peterson is concerned that the uh, Department of uh, Criminal Investigation, the uh, Wisconsin Department of Justice, is going to reinvestigate the crime itself. Um, nope, we're just reinvestigating the, in, the, in, the investigation. We don't really care. We, we, gotta, we, we, know, we, we know everything we need to know. Uh, we're not going to reinvestigate. Why, why do you suppose they, they didn't want to reinvestigate? The crime it's a itself. curious question in, in, in its face value, but if you dig into it even more, it's kind of, I don't know if it's, if it's correctly to be pointed at Deb anyway, because all she, she has, she has a fixed set of things to do, check or she was supposed to do, check and see if there was any legal or ethical wrongdoings in this case. Yep. It would not be her decision, and she would have no foreign no 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 knowledge to say that they weren't going to reinvestigate the crime. It wouldn't be her place to re, to decide who's going to reinvestigate the crime. It would be the attorney general. Yeah, to say but that. she but she certainly seems to know the answer to that question, though, doesn't she? Which is which is exactly which exactly you, you hit it exactly on that. Why is this curious, right? It's curious because she she knows the answer, where the answer that she shouldn't know, and they're not going to do it. Well, how 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 she know that answer? Exactly. <laughs> so she goes, "Oh, don't worry, Sheriff Peterson. I, I'm here and I'm asking you these questions, but basically nothing. Like we're not going to come and and go through your office and and ask you to, to show us that. Now, it just <laughs> we're just investigating the investigation, is all. Okay. Okay. Taking Enough a deep breath and moving on to the to the next Enough to the next one. Yeah. You're gonna be so, here all day. Okay. <laughs> so so they they return to the subject of Arlen Avery. Question: Did Arlen Avery uh, tell you that on the night that Stephen Avery was arrested, he observed concrete residue on Stephen Avery's right shoulder? Yes. And in essence, what he told you when he described that to Vogel was that Vogel ignored it. Correct. Okay. And Arlen Avery says uh, Jadowski, who is an uh, officer higher than him, told him that uh, Godsparik wanted to continue to investigate the case and that Kasarik said no, that the investigation was closed. Correct. Okay. What I really want to get at here is whether or not you have the belief as the investigator uh, that what Arlen Avery told you came to him from that what what Arlen Avery told you came to him from Jadowski was consistent with what Belki told you came came to him from Belts. I would have to read the two reports. I just don't recall. recall. I'm, I'm right. sorry. So, 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 so essentially, we have independent corroboration from two different um, sort of chains, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. that Kasarik is essentially putting his thumb down uh, on any further investigation uh, of, of, of this case, despite Arlen Avery's, uh, you know, protestations here, right? So, um, you know, her I, her, I just don't recall, is just yet another, um, you know, ignoring none, none of that made it into the final report. Um, and it was just whitewashed away. The fact that in the, in the final report, nobody knows what happens. We, I don't, we don't have the edits, the different edited versions of that report. All we have is the final one. So anything regarding any of this Kasarik business has just been completely and totally washed away. So, you know, with all this stuff, particularly, you know, the, the evidence of, of, Arl, of Arlen Avery, what they did with him uh, to the 
um, you know, suppressing his affidavit and burying this evidence. There's just no way um, that th that any meaningful consideration was given regarding Kasurik's ac Kasurik's actions, or or maybe me meaningful consideration was done and they just decided just to sweep it under the rug. That, that, that's only two ways to look at it. And then, kaboom, are you ready for the next one? The deposition. De Deb Strauss, get ready for this. And you, Deborah Strauss, and Amy Lehman agreed with Ar Arlen Avery. You thought that an investigation was never really done in the case. That is correct. Boom. Mic drop. Boom. That's, that, that's, that's a mic drop moment, right? Uh, what, what else is there to be said? She, even with her lack of until see, she, she did enough investigating to realize that there wasn't really an investigation done. But, uh, you know, she, she is certainly not at, at this point when she's under oath uh, and, you know, somebody has been, has, has had 18 years of their life just put, you know, people talk about that, like, especially the guilters. They talk about 18 right. years like it's nothing, right? right? 18 years. Can you imagine? 18 years. Um, a lot of people, they only get 18 good years. You know, you're growing up, you get 18 yeah. and you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. <laughs> yep. 18 and 18 is 36. You know? Right. Yep. I, I definitely, I definitely hear you. Um, so she, she did enough to know that there wasn't a real investigation. How, how is it possible that she's not recognizing the malfeasance that's going on here between Kasurik and Volk? And, and, what, and why isn't she putting them under the bus in this deposition? Right? She's probably because she's afraid. They probably gave her a good talking to before, um, before, this, before she had to give this deposition. It's quite interesting. I mean, in her mind, she didn't, did she, she's not, she's not on the hot seat. So she can just say, yeah, that's what I think. But at the end of the day, this is what I filed and it got signed off on. And the attorney general signed off on it. So why are you, why are you angry at me? So slide 15 is what, what Deb, uh, Deb says, what we're really looking for is whether Kasurik went or so, whether the police department went and talked to Kasurik, right? So, mm -hmm. so that, so then, then we'll go to slide 19 and we'll do this. We'll do the text we're about to talk about right now. And then we'll put in the, right. the grease spot quote. So Kasurik, uh, um, Bergner, again, is the uh, high, high up in the Manitowoc Police Department. He's either the chief or deputy chief over there. So question, Bergner told you that he went and talked to Kasurik about the information that he, Bergner, had concerning Gregory Allen, right? Correct. No report was prepared by Kasurik about the information that was brought to him by Bergner. Is that right? That's right. That's correct. So that being the case, the very policy that the sheriff says that he was maintaining, he violated when he failed to record what Mr. Bergner told him. Correct. And some, some lawyer objects, but he said he says cor correct, right? So, um, you know, so it was, it was uh, Kasurik, uh, you know, or earlier. Uh, so that, that, then we can play. Then we can play the quote. Penny Burnson goes to the police. And she says, look, I think it might be somebody else. And worse, the police agency, the city police agency, a larger police agency, goes with Penny, a detective, to the sheriff and says, look, I think you really got the wrong guy. We've been tracking this other person, Gregory Allen, who matches the description much better. I think he's the guy that did it. All right, so, so there's two things going on here, uh, Jeff, with regard to, um, you know, uh, Kasur. First of all, he's lying through his teeth. Um, he does not recall uh, being, um, you know, uh, th that, that Manitowoc came to him. Now, of course, that's why uh, Deb and Amy were, you know, looking for evidence that somebody from the police department went and talked to Kasurik in the first place. Kasurik denied that that happened, right? That quote that we just listened to from Mike Griesbach makes it clear, <laughs> pretty damn clear, that not only not only did 
the Manitowoc Police Department in the form of Bergner go to Kisurik, but they took friggin' Penny Bernstein with them to, 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 to go and talk to him. You'd think, you'd think he would recall that, right? That's, that's number one, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> active chicanery. Number two, Kisurik was so concerned, I followed all the protocol there was, you know, I've been sheriff for a hundred years, I know what the protocol is, and I followed it to the, to the letter of the law. Um, well, protocol, I got news for you, Protocol says that you're supposed to write a report about it. He's not going to write a that that of all things. He's gonna he's gonna bury uh, you know uh, how, what, what's it go eight, uh, eight, eight, 80 miles out and seven feet under is that or six feet under eighty six that report. <laughs> so wow. he did not he did not write a report on that. Uh, and it's obvious why he didn't write a report on that. Um, but it's it's also very obvious that he went and somehow. Griesbach is not, I mean, at, at, the, at the risk of being sued, right? Mike Griesbach is talking at conferences and, uh, and, and saying, you know, um, Bergner went there with, with Penny Bernstein. He's got no problem saying that in, in, in public. Uh, he, he would be subject, I'm, I'm sure, to uh, some type of libel, a lawsuit, if that wasn't true. I think people would want to sue him for that. Um, and uh, yet, uh, somehow, uh, Kisurik is somehow able to get away by telling uh, by telling Penny and Amy, I, I don't recall. So uh, De Deb is asked uh, because he, uh, she, and Amy Lehman um, went to talk to Vogel, and when they talked to Vogel, when they went and talked to Vogel, unlike any of the other interviews a very special visitor shows up to that interview. And I don't, I don't even think you're gonna need any guesses as to who that was, um, who showed up. You know, man, it's what, and isn't, and isn't, if you look at, as you look at those pictures, isn't there a stunning, isn't there a stunning uh, resemblance between uh, Tom Fallon and Emperor Palpatine? I think there is. That's why I put it. He does, that yes. He does have a uh, <laughs> look on his face very, you uh, <laughs> know. So, 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 the, so the question, and for this interview, the interview of Vogel, unlike any of the other interviews, Assistant Attorney Generals Jennifer Nashold and Tom Fallon were present. Correct. How is that decided? believe that was the only interview we did in Madison. We uh, it was actually done at the DCI office and they stated that they wanted to be present during the interview. They the being they, they being uh, uh, Fallon, National, National. Tom yeah. Fallon. Yep. So why did they, why did they show up? They were nervous. So um, I, I, I think that they were I think that they were nervous. Uh, when, when we when we go over the um, when we go over the deposition of uh, Amy Lehman, we're going to find uh, and we're obviously not doing that in one sitting. <laughs> we're going to we're going to find that uh, Vogel's lawyer started to object to some of the things that were being said by Kasurik and the lawyer for Manitowoc County. So there there was definitely concern that Vogel, uh, and this, this was, uh, I, th I think, uh, might have been Seeking Truth for Good, had a Reddit article about this, that was, what was Vogel flipping, right? Was Vogel really nervous that the hammer was coming down on him? Because he was individually named, right, as one of the, as one of the defendants. So uh, why would, why would Fallon and Nashville show up to Vogel's deposition? Well, maybe, 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 they, maybe they needed to be there to sort of, you know, keep their eye on him as to what, as to what he might say, because he was get maybe he was getting a little antsy. So, uh, on to the next, I guess, uh, Vol, Dennis Vol, he looks a lot different in that picture. Uh, there, there's a picture of him in, in, uh, uh, the man one when he still has a lot of hair. Uh, he's actually, mm -hmm. uh, you put those two pictures next to each other. You might not even uh, recognize <laughs> the, the two, the two together to be the same person. We might, we might need a light box. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, question very close to the end. Okay. Uh, so by then when you're talking with Vogel, 
you've already completed the interviews of the women in Vogel's office who had t told you uh, who had told you what they had told Vogel. Yes. All right. And two more paragraphs down on 5,586. You ask him if he can recall any of his own staff talking to him about concerns that Allen was the better suspect. Correct. And he says there may have been such a discussion, but I can't remember it. Correct. <laughs> so he has no memory of any suggestions that Allen was in Door County or Allen was somewhere else and therefore couldn't be a suspect. Correct. <laughs> well, there's only one conclusion that we can draw, Jeff, and that's there's something in the water in Wisconsin that just is causing rampant memory loss uh, in, in certain public elected officials. I, I don't see how there's any other uh, conclusion that we can draw. <laughs> it's quite stunning. <laughs> he doesn't remember saying it on uh, multiple times. <laughs> And it's what it's it's certainly one of the things that 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 reverberates through the uh, through the truth or community wasn't even on probation, wasn't even in jail, hadn't been in jail yet, wasn't even on probation. And he says it multiple times as an excuse as to why it couldn't be Gregory Allen to his to his minions. And yet he can't remember when, when he's talking to Deb and then Strauss. when asked about it. He can't remember anything about it to Deb Strauss. That's right. But right. he would have been asked about it in, in his own deposition, right? So what we're talking about now is his interview for the Peg Whitewash with Deb Strauss. That's very right. soon, very soon, his own personal deposition was being scheduled. Uh, and so was Kaserik's. As a matter of fact, for November 10th. But what happened on November 9th? Uh, is that the day Stephen Avery was arrested? Stephen Avery is arrested on November 9th on the charge of possession of a felon in charge, firearm? Uh, felon in possession of a firearm. And, and therefore, Kaserik's deposition is canceled. And I think I, f I forget the exact date that Vogels is scheduled for, but I think it's within it's within 10 days of that. He, he was going to have to answer what Vogel was going to have to answer. How come you use the excuse that Gregory Allen was on probation to, to proceed with it, with the prosecution of Stephen Avery? He was going to get asked that question. You know, maybe not, that might not have been the first question, but that question would have been in there and they would have, they would have, uh, you know, waited a long time for that answer. And it all washed away. And if, if, and if you were, the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office, and you had a fear that um, Vogel was flipping, and you were nervous that Vogel might say in his deposition, I can't take this pressure anymore. I, I'm just going to come out because I'm individually named. I, I, I'm running out of excuses here. I don't have any good excuses left. My best excuse is Kasurik threatened me or Kasurik, uh, you know, he was so powerful. He put so much pressure on me. I felt he had to do it or he was holding something over my head or, um, you know, n name that too. And it would line up with, and it would line up with his behavior towards Alan, a or, uh, I'm sorry, Arland Avery. Arland Avery. Yep. It would, that would have been a lineup of MO, right? He That's told right. me this, he threatened me, you know, et cetera. So what, what would you have done to, to, if you're the if you're the sheriff's office to not have Vogel flip on you, you say, "Well, okay, well, you know what, uh, Dennis, have no fear. We're going to make this go away." And true to their word, Stephen Avery's arrested on November 9th, the day before Kasurik's deposition. Ta-da! Hey, Rocky, why should you pull a rabbit out of my hat? <laughs> Kaserik was going to have to sit in that deposition on November 10th. And the evidence of, or the, the um, you know, the, the, the statements of Mike Riesbach, which, which are, you know, not, not only did the Manitowoc 
police department come, they brought Penny Bernstein with them and said, we think this is Gregory Allen because I've been getting phone calls and it has to be from Allen because Stephen Avery's in prison without access to a frigging telephone. He was going to have to answer. Why did, why did you still pursue the prosecution when the victim is telling you they're, they're, they're getting phone calls from someone who really is coming off as the assailant, probably providing certain details, right? As to why she as, as to why uh, she thinks that he was going to have to answer that question un, under oath in a in a deposition, and it was good. And uh, I, uh, what what's what are you going to say? I don't recall that it didn't happen. You can't say it didn't happen because you know everybody knows it happened. Griesbach knows it happened. Bergner knows it happened, and probably Penny Bernstein could probably even recollect it. Would be my guess. What are you going to say? I, I, I you know. <laughs> What can you possibly say? He was in deep shit. All right. So uh, on, on to the next word. We're getting close to done here, uh, which, All right. which is which is nice. Um, uh, Judy Dvorak. Um, <laughs> did you believe she had any animosity towards Stephen Avery? Yes. That's right. <laughs> and did she tell you, I'm the one who said, that sounds like Stephen Avery. No, she did not. She did not. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. So she, uh, at least she's sticking to it. She's sticking to her guns. And, and wouldn't it be funny if, if nobody actually said that they just kind of <laughs> invented that, but right. It's, it's, uh, she, she didn't, she didn't fess up. Um, okay. Uh, did Deb object to the conclusions? Uh, so this this is a this is a good um, this is a the good question. One. Yeah, that's the next. Yep. Um, did Deb object to the conclusions? And that, that again, that's not a picture of Deb. That's a picture of Peg uh, Lautenschlager. And the conclusions of the report were: there's no basis to bring criminal charges or assert ethics violations. After all we've talked about, mm -hmm. Jeff, isn't that is is it's complete? It's unimaginable. Um, and we've only talked about one of the investigators. That's Deb Stroud. We haven't even gotten to Amy Lehman yet. Um, but but from all the stuff we've talked about, you know, is is it is it clear that the stuff that Kasarik did, the stuff that Vogel did, was completely and totally unethical with regard to lying about uh, Gregory Allen, with regard to pursuing a conviction of somebody that you knew was innocent. Remember the the the, um, Al, the Gregory Allen file was in uh, the Avery, the 1985 Avery case file. It was in there. Isn't it obvious that there were ethical violations here with what Kasarik did with tamping down um, you know, Ar Arnold Avery? Arnold Avery was actually demoted um, it, uh, short, shortly after this, right? Because of probably for making noise about this case. Um, it's, it, it's just incomprehensible that you can't find a single Ethics violation here, Peg. Come on, really? Okay, so um, did you object to the conclusions? Uh, so, so here, here's the first question that's not stated there. Did you did you read the report? Well, I was asked to read it through. Yes. And by whom were you asked to do that? I'm assuming Jennifer. That that'd be Jennifer Nashold. That's for people who don't have a scorebook at home. Uh, who's now who's now a, uh, a circuit court who, who's now a court of appeals judge, and, and uh, there was a chance that uh, the, the last Avery uh, appeal might uh, have gone to a place where she was where where she was sitting on the court of appeals and she would have had to recuse herself. Um, but anyway, uh, and and were you asked uh, to provide feedback to her, and if you had any concerns about any of the determinations that were made about what actually happened? I'm sure I was. Uh, and did you object to uh, this description, for example? No. D did you object to any of the determinations that were made? I don't recall if I did or not. I can't remember. <laughs> I don't recall if I objected to the to the summary of a report I filed. <laughs> Think about that. Yeah. So you yeah. did all the legwork. You submitted this to have a report filed. 
the, the report is completed. And it's a public. whitewash. And it's a whitewash. You were exposed to all the facts, right? You saw you all the people through. saying, yeah, and, read through. And you can't remember if you agreed with it or not? That's right. You can't recall whether or not she had, whether she objected, found, w- <laughs> ill-considered any and of now, the- probably the highest level case she's, one of the highest level cases she's ever been involved in, maybe the biggest ever of her career, that goes, that is invest. you know what I'm saying? Like, this is not a, you know, this is not a run-of-the-mill kind of day. Yeah, it's just it's it's unbelievable that she couldn't really smell what was going on. So, right. you know, I'm getting more. I'm 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 slowly. Dr- I'm even after all this time, I'm drifting more and more into your camp that, uh, you know, that that it's impossible that Deb was really that fog bound, or uh, you know, or whether she had sort of malicious intent, if you will, at heart. Or I shouldn't say malicious. That's the wrong word. Just whether she went in it to to facilitate the whitewash that happened. Just go through the motions. Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, I think that really, I think that was the end of the, um, the, the first deposition. The second deposition was very quick. It's only a few pages and they actually talk about her investigation into, uh, the, the lineup because there was, there are several, the, the lineup is talked about in the, in the peg report. Uh, so mm-hmm. that's actually the next slide. We had an extensive conversation on the podcast, uh, about, about this. Um, right. so, um, <laughs> no, infor- um, I like that. no information to challenge the integrity of the process that, that's right that that's what that's what it says in the uh in in the report um so question all right the last sentence on this page says the department has not uncovered any information challenging the integrity of the uh, of the composite process Right. So, so <laughs> but you were told uh, Couché saw a mugshot of Avery before making and I, and I say tracing. Right. I mean, you, you we went into this. Right. And it's obvious that this is a trace. Um, the composite sketch, um, <laughs> which which is how this is not how it's supposed to happen. Right. So the question. Uh, um, Avery told you that Shadowski told him that Couché saw Avery's mugshot before he drew the composite, didn't he? Wow, I mean, if it's in the report, yes, he did, right? So, 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 some, somebody, right. somebody, rat this guy Jadowski, ratted out, um, you know, the the process and, sa- and said that Couché actually had access to the bug shot before he, he did it, right? So, which we uh, just that, saw that, him say in the last couple episodes. No, 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 I didn't, I didn't see it. It may have been there. But I didn't, I didn't, you know, it wasn't available to me, I think is the words he said. Yeah, right. And this guy says, yes, it was. Um, and which is obviously a, a violation of the process. But look, look what, look what Deb says, right? So, so, um, you know, they, they bring, they bring that up, right? Uh, I mean, she says, why don't you read what, what she says to, in, uh, in response to some of these questions that are asked. I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of doing a composite process. I don't know what the rules are for that. So I don't, I mean, I would think that it would, yes, but so, so again, in other words, I don't know what it, the rules are. Yeah. In, in other words, she has no freaking idea uh, exactly what, you know, how, what, what, what the order of things are supposed to be in the composite process. So how is she going to be ha- have the capacity to come to the conclusion that there was a procedural violation, and th- and and that's outside of ethics? Because um, she doesn't even know what the rules are. That? They don't teach that to <laughs> officers. Yeah, they don't. They don't teach that to people in the white collar crime division. <laughs> it just, it, and 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 here's the other thing. Okay, so what if so she let's say she had no training in it. Well, it's kind of your job to figure out the details. Yeah. If you don't understand how it's supposed to be, you find out how is it supposed to be. Then you ask yeah. them, what did you do? Exactly right. And then you make a conclusion. So breathing, breathing deeply, uh, the, uh, as part of any deposition, uh, the people get to cross-examine the witnesses, the, law- the lawyers get to cross-examine. 
Uh, and again, I didn't very deeply cover that, uh, but the high level points that they hit, which they probably hit over the course of several questions, uh, were that, um, you know, a bunch of what you heard today from the lawyers of the, of the people bringing the suit, that was kind of hearsay, right? This person said this and that person said that, um, you know, that, uh, and, and you, you heard that this person said this, that's all hearsay, right? That's, that's not uh, admissible in court, right? Um, and that's, that's the kind of question, that's like an example of the kind of questions that they ask her. Another one would be, how can anybody possibly remember, uh, you know, the details uh, of this correctly after 18 years, right? That's another question they asked her with that, you know, you have to take that into account. And that, that's actually, there is some level of legitimacy to that, um, but, but it doesn't go as deep <laughs> as, as they're trying to intimate, right? Uh, and, and lastly, you know, the, the galling one that, that our friend Dr. Silpin brings up all the time, this was really Penny's fault, wasn't it, for being, for being such a good witness. Uh, and that, that is, uh, you know, that's a paraphrase. Um, but, uh, you know, what are you going to do when you have an eyewitness saying this is uh, the case? And that, and that, was, that, that was the extent of the, uh, the deposition. But this overall process had a, uh, a tremendous impact on Deb Strauss, right? And somehow, um, you know, some, somehow it, uh, you know, really uh, affected her opinion of, of Stephen Avery. Now, as we said in the beginning uh, of, of the, you know, uh, we felt one of the very first uh, set of questions they asked her, if she did have, did she have any knowledge of the Avery case? It's actually hard to believe that she had knowledge of Stephen Avery, but didn't have knowledge of the Avery case itself, right? I mean, that, those, those two things are almost... Uh, you know, mutually exclusive. That was a that was a gigantic, um, that you know that that was the biggest news in, in all of Wisconsin. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to believe that she would have had some prior knowledge of Steve and not have uh, any knowledge of the Avery case, right? You'd you'd have been you've been all over that. It's, it's even amazing that or b b before the I should say before the uh, the case. So maybe if we can bring up. Play, play this clip is just very interesting. Now, the date of this clip, the date that this clip happens, is very is very interesting. This this uh, is calls to Calumet County on November fourth, two thousand five. So just to just to uh, just to uh, get people uh, acclimated to a timeline, um, Teresa goes missing on October thirty first. Um, uh, uh, what's what's his uh, Karen Halbach calls uh, Calumet at two thirty Wednesday, November third, to say uh, her daughter's missing. The Rav Four is discovered on November fifth, right at the Avery Salvage Yard. This call happens on November fourth to Calumet County. Yeah, my name is Jeff Stoltz. I'm a special agent with the uh, Division of Criminal Investigation. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I'm calling is I've done some, some past investigations on Stephen Avery. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching the news and I'm seeing his name come up. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's anything I can offer to help you guys. Um, I think it's Evan Sam. That's in good conscience, she said. It was in her good conscience to pick up the call, Jeff, because she she's she's intellectually curious when she wants to be, 
<laughs> when she wants to be, when it's against Stephen Avery. I mean, how do you investigate that charge? Stephen Avery raped Penny. No, she didn't. I'm going to go investigate. Was there ethical or legal implications in this case? Did people really screw it up? And out of her realization of everything that we just went through, her result is, I don't like Stephen Avery. She's no fan of Stephen Avery. Um, no fan. Yeah, let's no not, let's fan of Stephen Avery. Avery. No fan. And, and she... Me, and I mean, I'm not a fan of Stephen Avery, but I can see no. that in 1985, there were some major, major missteps. And I mean, she knew nothing about it, though. She she knew nothing about the Avery case before this thing happened. Um, right. To, so, to, so, so, she, so her it process, was this case. It was this case that her investigation during this case of which made Avery, her dislike Stephen. What else could it have been? What what other investigation has she done on him? So there's a lot of there's a lot to unpack in that phone call. By the way, uh, you know we we used uh, uh, the, the clip from my good friend Millbilly's channel on that, and he no, nobody has done more research on the audio than than, than Millbilly has. Um, so thank you, Millbilly, for that video, and thank you to whoever FOIA the original information on that. Yeah, I got the link find out who that is. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so she does, she doesn't even know whether or not she's allowed to do it. She she works for the division of white collar crime or or uh, public what a public integrity. What she she doesn't what 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 what, exactly. what does she have to offer? You know what I mean? She does, she's not you know she's not an investigative an investigative officer. You know what I mean? She's she's a special agent, but she doesn't even she work even in that acknowledges. department. acknowledges. She doesn't even know if she can legally give any assistance, but she's ready if legally she can. So, so she sees it on the news. She, you're correct. She, she sees it on the news. Um, <laughs> but what she's seeing on the news, you know, maybe we can grab one of those commercials, right? On, on the news, people are coming and they're saying, you know, to Stephen Avery saying things like, oh, you know, sitting too close to home, uh, you know. That's right. Uh, <laughs> that's right they're interviewing him and they're saying you know oh well and it's probably one of the times where it's like you know oh the family they must be going through hell remember they made yeah, that yeah. statement and they that they must be going through hell and hitting too close to home and for something like that to happen and so you have to put yourself in her mind now right in her brain she's already she has already put two and two together while well, she's put two and three together and come to four. <laughs> she's already That's coming right. to the conclusion that Stephen Avery's probably guilty for this crime. Yes. And if not, Hey, if you need any help setting him up, here's my card. But you let me know even equipment. Did she offer equipment? She did. Technical assistance, yeah. technical assistance, technical whatever that tech, that usually means yeah. equipment. Yeah. Right, <clears throat> and, you know, and the thing is, we 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 know for a fact because of the call, uh, which I'm sure we're going to get into on Wednesday. Um, we 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 know from the um, boss has a change of plans call that at least on as of November, the morning of November fifth, they thought they they thought that her track was leave, left the Avery's and went to Zippers, so they had her leaving the Avery salvage yard, and they at least in their minds because they thought. You know, and it's as given by the evidence of the phone call from Weger to Remaker, we think she uh, went from Avery's to Zipper's. Go back over so, to Zipper. He's not going to be happy about this. I remember that yeah. phone call. Yep. Zipper is not going to be happy. Yeah, because he's a drunk and <laughs> a belligerent drunk. <laughs> he doesn't want to deal with anybody, right? Yeah, but that's the thing, right? I mean, so, so they they had her in their minds. Even as late as the morning of the November 5th, prior to the RAV being discovered, as leaving the Avery Salvage Yard. If she, you know, if, if you can prove she left the Avery Salvage Yard, it's game over, right? And they thought she, right, it's game over for the case. Their, their, their case is completely blown if it can be proved that she left, the, that she actually left the Avery Salvage Yard. That, the case is over. Um, 
because their their narrative completely relies on the fact that she never left. Um, right. And uh, right. you know, and and that is such a strong point that even as of the morning of November fifth, they thought she'd left. So what's all this focus on Stephen Avery from Deb Strauss? Quite fishy. When, yep. again, yep. when she went through the report, we just went through it. We, we understand what happened. We've been covering this for a month now on the podcast. Yep. The report yep. clears Stephen Avery of being a sexual predator. He's not a bad dude. But at the end of this, she comes out with this perception that he's this horrible person and that she's he's so bad. And that her investigation in the past has led her to believe, well, if you need help, I'm, I'm, I'm your gal. Yeah. Well, she's, she, why is she, she no fan of Stephen Avery? Is it because she just had the shit kicked out of her in that deposition? Is that, Great is that question. what's leading her to, a, to a, uh, being no fan of Stephen Avery? I think you probably just hit it on the head there. <laughs> yeah. Being That's what I thought. Having, him, having him watch. No, it's a great point. I should have, yeah, I should have put two and two in that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so, sitting across the table and seeing him every day through the, you know, all every hour. There he is watching me. Yep. Yeah. I, guess just, I wouldn't be a fan. Yeah. Him and Jody went to most of those uh, depositions. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if he, if they were at that one or she had to look across and see his, you know, see, seeing his, like his shocked face as they asked her these questions about what she did and didn't do it. I, I, I can't imagine that, that Stephen has a very good poker face. <laughs> Yeah, right, right. So awesome. With, well, with that, Jeff. Through the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. With that said, you know, anything, I think we kind of hit it, but if there's anything else you want to add in. Well, Amy Lehman's next. Uh, we, we still have one more deposition uh, yet to go. Uh, uh, I think, uh, again, yeah. my closing remarks remain, remain the same. You, you have to understand the 1985 case to understand this case. They're not separate cases, right? They they are they are very much intertwined, uh, and the 1985 case uh, and the civil lawsuit, which came out of the 1985 case, never really got the chance to end in the depositions that it needed uh, to, that that needed to happen to properly conclude it, particularly those of Kasurik and Vogel. Because uh, Vogel's deposition is just a deposition. This is before anybody even goes into court, right? The, the, just the depositions that sort of collect the evidence that allow the attorneys to prepare the cases to actually begin the lawsuit in front of a judge, right? So that, that's that's what's going on here. Kucerich's definition uh, deposition was scheduled for November 10th. And Vogel's uh, was scheduled for sometime uh, inside of 10 days of, of Kucerich's. And... Uh, you know, Stephen Avery is arrest, uh, arrested for a felon in possession of a firearm on, on November 9th. These cases intersect very, uh, very closely. Um, you, you need to understand one to understand the other. There's very good reason uh, why the sheriff's office uh, did not want Kasarik to testify and perhaps even better reason why they did not want Vogel to testify. It would have been extremely inconvenient for Kasarik and it probably would have been very damning for Kasarik if Vogel had testified. Uh, but as it was, uh, miraculously, Stephen Avery, Stephen Avery is arrested uh, and his depositions are canceled. Uh, his lawsuit set, settled for 400, and, 400 to 450, something like that. Uh, and he uses all that money to hire lawyers, uh, Dean Strang and Jerry Buting. So, uh, and, uh, and the, the better that we understand 1985, uh, the more we can understand the the level of conspiracy. So, so now I think you know, I ha have have we really you know even even before the Hallback investigation begins, have we really witnessed two conspiracies now? So we or even three. <laughs> uh, so ha ha was was it a, what was the circumstances that sent him to prison in 1985? Was was that a conspiracy? I think the answer is obviously yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, was the um, what, what were the circumstances that uh, that um, the, the, that the sheriff of uh, or sorry, the, the, the Brown County call that Coburn got and Cor any attempt by Coburn to pursue that and say, hey, well, maybe there's somebody in jail here. Was was that does that rise to the level of conspiracy? 
maybe, maybe not. I don't know. You know, it's but certainly somebody putting putting their uh, putting their hand down, and, and that's just how how the, the the blue line gets followed. But this but this whitewash investigation that that we're seeing now is is that really a second conspiracy that that's that's sort of playing out before us, sending out uh, Deb and and Amy Lehman, and then the process of of, of taking you know even Deb Strauss even speaks the truth and said there's there's no investigation done here right, um, is is that in and of itself, uh, you know and 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 the subsequent whitewash not identifying Kaseric or Vogel for any, um, you know, for, for any ethical violations, is, is that yet a, a no kidding second conspiracy, uh, you know, that, that, that's uh, exonerating the, the law enforcement of the time. So these people who keep on telling, oh, you know, these conspiracies, they, they, just, they just can't happen uh, that large. If we hadn't had these depositions, None of this would, you know, none, none of this would have, would have came to light about this, uh, what, what I'm calling the second conspiracy. And people keep on telling me that they can't happen, yet they're playing out right before my eyes. So is it, how impossible is it for me to believe that, you know, some conspiracy, perhaps even on a larger scale, was conducted during the, uh, the, the, the 2005 investigation? It's completely believable. I, I just, yeah, I mean, I just I'm done I'm talking about it too. <laughs> And it's and and if you think about it, if you take all of the Stephen Avery aspect, everything, all the names, all the characters, take it out, and just say, when police corruption happens, and there's an investigation, is this how you want people of Wisconsin? Is this how you want investigations run, where it doesn't they just go through the motions and just to clear their fellow officer or to clear another department because you don't want to make waves because you don't want to be the person that locks up another officer that goes after law enforcement yep. is that really what we want because it, it seems that we're seeing a series like you're saying a series of of conspiracies and what's it to say that this isn't the norm it's almost believable that it's not right it's yeah and that's yeah. the scariest yeah. part and, and, let, and let's start people ha start having repercussions for you know corrupt actions nothing's going to change agree because you can just hide behind policy and oh you know you can w write up reports and file reports saying this or oh well yeah there was kind of something done wrong but you know Nothing that rises to the level of criminality, but or ethical violation. Things are changing, you know, you know, and things are changing. And in other states, I really believe this. I think we've seen in other states that there are some righting of wrongs, and maybe we should have a positive attitude that you know what, this ain't over yet. These people can still pay if 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 it's done correctly, or if you know. And so I guess that's you, you try to have faith in the system if you can, where you can. And expose. This is what we're doing. Exposing what we can, where we can. I, I, I'm, I'm glad to see that optimism, and I, and I share, and I share that optimism. And it's a, it's a good, it's a good place. Uh, optimism is a good place to end. Uh, I, I, I agree that I tend to see it too. That's not happening as fast as any of us would like, but I do, I do believe, like you, that it is happening. Well, that's a great place for us to leave it. And this has been. Um, discussing a murderer extras.